Paralyzed. This is 10 Minute Murder. Often, the life stories of serial killers begin with tragic, dysfunctional upbringings. But the beginning of Shawn Michael Great's childhood was perfectly normal. Born in 1976 in Marion, Ohio, he did struggle in school, was held back a grade, but he was also sporty. He was a social kid who got along well with others. Then, as Shawn grew older, things began to change. When Shawn was six years old, his parents got a divorce. And five years later, his mother, Teresa, abandoned her two children. She left them behind in Ohio with their father and moved to Kentucky to live with her new boyfriend. Sean spent his teenage years resenting Teresa for this decision, and he indulged in elaborate fantasies about killing his mother and making her pay for what she had done. While Sean and his brother were living with their father, Sean began attending River Valley High School. At first, he continued using sports as an outlet for his feelings and became one of the school's best baseball players, until he broke his arm. When the fracture was x-rayed, doctors discovered a tumor which required immediate surgery. After that, Sean never played baseball again. From that point, Sean's mental health took a turn. One of his high school girlfriends remembered that he went through severe depressive episodes where he would lay on the couch for days. Once the episode was over, he'd continue with his life like nothing ever happened. Despite this, Sean never had a hard time getting a date. His school friend, Amy Smith, said, Sean was charming, he was always smiling, and he had those big blue eyes. All the girls liked Sean. Sean might have been considered a heartthrob, but he wasn't a good boyfriend. As his relationships progressed, he became more and more jealous and controlling, and after a while, he'd eventually become violent. When he was 18 years old, he was arrested for the first time after he grabbed a girlfriend by her neck during an argument. His next arrest came the following year, shortly after he graduated from high school, when he was caught breaking into a house. He was charged with a felony burglary and sentenced to four years in prison, but he ended up being released early. That time behind bars did not change Sean. If anything, his violent behavior towards women only escalated after he was released in 1997. Two years later, Sean's girlfriend reported him to the police, saying that he had choked her almost to the point of unconsciousness. The girl was 17 years old, and she was a few months pregnant with Sean's child. Sean's adult life continued the same way. He was a ladies' man, but he was a menace to the women he dated often terrorizing his girlfriends and threatening them whenever they stood up to him. If there was one thing that Sean hated more than anything else, it was a woman who told him no. He briefly got married and became a father once again, but only a few months after the wedding, his wife had enough and she filed for divorce. On September 13, 2016, a 911 call came through in Ashland, Ohio. A female caller claimed that she had been kidnapped two days ago, and since then, her captor had kept her tied to a bed, repeatedly raping her. To protect the victim's identity, her name was never released to the public, and she was only known by the moniker Jane Doe. And Jane Doe was certain that she knew the identity of the kidnapper. In fact, he was somebody who she'd been friends with for several months. She told the police that his name was Sean Michael Great and she had been held captive in the abandoned house that he was living in. The police rushed to that address that Jane was calling from, and they were able to save her and apprehend her captor. After her rescue, she revealed more details about her ordeal. She'd met Sean in the summer of 2016 at the local community center and viewed him as an older brother type. The two of them often met up for lunch together or to go on walks where they would talk about the Bible. Jane had been aware that Sean was romantically interested in her, but she dodged his advances and even refused his attempts to get her cell phone number. 
Then, on the 11th of September, Sean invited Jane Doe to come over to a house in Ashland, where she began to read the Bible. Sean left to go to the kitchen, and when he came back, Jane didn't recognize the man she'd come to view as a friend. His friendly demeanor had vanished, and he grabbed the Bible, saying, quote, You're not going anywhere. When Jane continued resisting Sean's sexual advances, he physically overpowered her and tied her to the bed. Throughout the following days, Sean regularly retied Jane Doe into different weird positions. On one occasion, he told her that he'd positioned the ropes so that if she struggled, she would be strangled to death. When Sean fell asleep, Jane was able to free herself from the restraints and managed to place that 911 call that saved her life. When the police arrived at the abandoned house where Sean kept Jane prisoner, they immediately noticed an unmistakable stench. The entire house was full of piles of trash, surrounded by swarming flies and maggots. But the smell wasn't coming from the trash. It was coming from the two decomposing bodies that Sean had hidden under piles of dirty laundry. Those bodies belonged to two young women, Elizabeth Griffin and Stacy Stanley. Both of them had been strangled to death, and Sean hadn't bothered to dispose of their bodies. He'd just hidden them, pretty badly, and then gone on a hunt for his next victims. Sean was then indicted for two counts of aggravated murder for Elizabeth and Stacy's deaths, as well as the sexual assault and abduction of Jane Doe, and lesser counts of tampering with evidence and breaking and entering. The defense filed a not guilty plea by reason of insanity. Meanwhile, the prosecution announced that they would be pushing for the death penalty. By his 2018 trial, Sean hadn't just confessed to the charges he was facing, he'd also claimed to have killed three other women. After Sean revealed details about the additional murders to local news stations, the defense and prosecution joined forces to request a gag order that would prevent him from talking to the media. Throughout the trial, Sean showed absolutely no remorse. The following month, he was found guilty of both murders and sentenced to death. In March 2019, Sean pleaded guilty to murdering two other women, Rebecca Lacey in 2015 and Candace Cunningham in 2016. He had dated Candace for several months and even lived with her for a while, and throughout their relationship, he admitted to fantasizing about murdering her. Rebecca Lacey was also someone that Sean knew personally, although he wasn't as close with her as he was with Candace. And all of his victims were killed in the same fashion, strangled to death. Sean gave investigators directions to Candace's body, which was found behind a burnt house in Madison Township. Rebecca's body had been found in 2015 in a patch of woodland in Ashland County. Before Sean's confession, Rebecca's death was believed to be an accidental overdose. Now, police knew that Sean had killed her over a petty dispute. She allegedly had stolen $4 from him and paid for it with her life. In September that same year, Sean pleaded guilty to a fifth murder, a woman whose unidentified body had been found in Marion County in 2006. Sean's confession eventually led to the woman being identified as Dana Lowry, a 23-year-old mother of two. Shortly after his original trial, Sean's attorney appealed his death sentence, but in 2020, the Ohio Supreme Court dismissed this appeal and upheld the sentence. As of October 2023, his execution is scheduled for the 19th of March, 2025. At Sean's second trial, the family friend of one of his victims addressed him directly, saying, quote, you will die with a needle in your arm, with no more notoriety than a junkie who overdoses in an alley. You will die, you will burn, and you will be completely forgotten. Sean's mother, Teresa, was approached by the media countless times after her son's arrest. Finally, she agreed to give one interview with the Daily Mail. She shared that she believed time behind bars had changed Sean into someone she didn't recognize. But she also believed that he had spent his life using his charming nature to get what he wanted. Quote, Yes, he's good-looking, she said, but the devil's good-looking too.
That's 10-Minute Murder for today. Brief and bingeable true crime. I'm Joe. I'm the host. And I really appreciate you taking the time out of your day to listen to this episode. If you're brand new, I'm super excited that you're here. Hope you enjoyed the episode. And if you did, be sure to subscribe before you go. It more easily lets you catch up on all the back episodes and find 10-Minute Murder wherever you like to listen to podcasts. Connect with me on social media to see the pictures of what we talk about here on the podcast. And it's never gross or graphic stuff. Ratings and reviews help the show grow, so please do that. And finally, this is the first episode I'm doing in the month of November. Halloween just happened, and I need to ask a question. Do we not do Halloween anymore? I bought a bucket of candy and was all ready for the trick-or-treaters. I don't, we're not doing it anymore, I guess. There were like three kids. And at one point, I made the executive decision to just not get my hopes up anymore, turned off the porch light, and I enjoyed the Kit Kats and Snickers bars myself. I don't know. Maybe I'm maybe I'm missing something somewhere. There might have been a, a, a news release that it was happening on a different day, and I just wasn't paying attention to it. But three trick-or-treaters for an entire bucket of candy that I had. And I do the good stuff, too. I wanted to be the house that has the full-size bars. The ones when, like I was a kid, I'd go back and say, hey, go to this house. They've got the full-size stuff over there. They're not messing around. I wanted to be that house, but three trick-or-treaters. Anyway, that's your episode for today. Thank you so much for listening to 10-Minute Murder.